Greetings, I'm Shad and this is my spaceship that I've recently designed and in this video I'm going to be sharing with you all the thought processes and design elements that I put into this ship to make it my perfect spaceship. So my design philosophy for making this ship was what would be the perfect ship for me? What are the things that I would want if I was to have a spaceship? And I call it the Rogue 4x6 SS Mark III. And to break down what that means, 4x6 refers to the thruster or propulsion engine configuration, SS standing for Space Shuttlecraft, Mark III because this is the third design of this series of spaceship by the company that produces them. As for the uh, specific or a personal name that the owner would call it, uh, I haven't made that up yet because I don't know who owns it, I was just mainly designing the ship. And so until I come up with anything more uh, specific, it will be called the Sword because swords are awesome. And I personally think this ship is awesome. Now, first of all, I believe this is technically a shuttlecraft, not... Uh, well, a shuttlecraft is a spaceship, uh, but there's a bit of a, you know, uh, a distinction between the two. A shuttlecraft being a smaller spaceship, and when you just say spaceship, you're generally referring to something bigger. Or you could just call the big ones a starship. But I specifically wanted to design a small ship, like one that was versatile, but as small as it could be, but not a fighter, like a short-range fighter, uh, uh, something that... Uh, could give you all the necessities you need to get all the things done that you would want to do with a spaceship in space, but have it as small as possible. Which also means, being small, it will be more affordable and also more manoeuvrable. One of the things, of course, you would need to consider when creating a fictional, you know, futuristic science fiction spaceship is what technology would exist in the setting or the, the world in which it exists within. And so this ship is based within my own fictional science fiction setting called Rogue Star, which is a setting that I run my science fiction role-playing games in, and I'd like to write a few stories in the future within this setting as well. And so I fleshed out quite a bit of stuff within this setting in terms of the technology and other things, and so everything in the ship is being designed and uh, applied to what exists within my own setting. And I'll point out what some of those technologies are as we go through the design elements of my spaceship. All right, the very first thing that I particularly would want out of a spaceship is for it to be multi-purpose. I love the feel of having a multi-purpose ship, which means it gives me options. If I want to do something, I would love, you know, my spaceship to be able to have provision or ability to do it. So if I wanted to transport a whole heap of cargo containers, I would want the ship to be able to haul those cargo containers. I would want it to be, I would want to be able to take it on long range missions and short range missions, whether to scout for military or prospecting planets or to find out enemy or pirate positions in space. I'd want to be able to use it in a full-on heavy dogfight, so to be a full-on fighter equipped with all the bells and whistles, but to also be a private vessel at the same time. And so yes, multi-purpose, that's what I would want. And so that was one of the main kind of ideals I had in mind going into designing this ship. And so to achieve that, I needed to add certain features in. One, I needed to add certain living facilities, such as a bed, a toilet, a shower. And that means it has to have a little bit more room than just the cockpit, though I certainly wanted to make it as room efficient as possible, so very compact and kind of all together. But with those, you know, elements in, that enables the ship to be able to travel over much longer distances. You could stay in the ship for months at a time easily. It needs to have power to be able to haul cargo, but it also needs to have parts on the ship that can hook on to those cargo containers as well. And the thrusters can't get in the way of where those cargo containers will be. And I say thrusters even when really this uh, ship has propulsion engines, not thrusters. And of course, it needs big guns if I want to take it into battle. Now, the type of armaments that uh, this ship has is, of course, you can see the two, you know, big point defense cannon turrets on the top and bottom of the ship. And uh, I love those things. I really like big, powerful cannons. Now, one of the things that I wanted, I was very specific about with these guns is that I didn't want anything in the way. And so you'll notice that the uh, turret that's at the top, it can turn around full 360 degrees and it won't, the, the gun staying at level won't be turning to face any components on the ship, so it can't shoot itself, in other words. But because it has a, a turret on the top and bottom, it basically has full protection. It can shoot any opposing ship, no matter where it is, in position to the ship. So wherever an enemy, you know, spaceship is, the sword, or the Rogue 4x6 SS Mark III, can fire back at it with some pretty high-powered weaponry. Now, what are these type of guns? Well, I just call them high-yield energy weapons, because they're in the setting, it's in the future so much that the power of guns have, has gotten to such a level that has rendered armor on spaceships useless. If you get hit by one of these guns, the ship is basically going to be destroyed, unless it is a very, very large starship. But still, these cannons can blast through 
basically 20 meter thick heavy steel armaments. Now that might change dependent on if it's a more futuristic alloy and other things like that, but still these guns are really powerful, to the point that it renders any type of armor on comparably sized spaceships like the Rogue completely useless, which is why the Rogue has no armor on it either. But there are types of shields within the, my science fiction setting, and those types of shields are amazing. They will basically block any type of uh, destructive or energy weapon, including nuclear yield powered weapons, like if they're the power of nucleus level armaments. But when you get to the level of nuclear power, so I call those massive energy weapons, that is when the energy shields on spaceships will actually deplete. But anything underneath those massive energy levels, like these big cannons on a spaceship, they actually can't affect the shields at all. You can hit them a thousand times and the shields won't be affected at all. They will still stay up and be fine. The issue is, is how rare the material is that powers the shields are, or is, how rare it is. And so everyone just can't have shields and be invincible to those types of cannons. It's very, very difficult to get the material. So then having shields is a very, you know, special privilege within this setting. It's difficult to get those things working. Now, aside from the primary cannons on this ship, you might notice these two differently designed guns on the sides of the ship. And they are what are called rod cannons within my setting. And so using the technology of mass manipulation that's in the setting, it reduces the mass of tungsten rods and then through electron acceleration or electromagnetic acceleration it can propel those rods at near light speed which is a very very powerful weapon and if you were to bombard a planet with these cannons well it's like rapid fire nuclear weapons but interestingly enough they might not be as destructive as i once thought when you fire them at another spaceship in my video where i talk about the technology of my science fiction setting it's under the roleplay or sci-fi playlist on my channel i talk about the pulse field generators one of my viewers pointed out that my rods might not actually be as destructive as I thought when, when on, if you fire them onto other spaceships, because what he felt would most likely happen is that the rods would just puncture a hole straight through the ship and come out the other side, and it wouldn't cause a massive explosion because there's not enough mass in this ship for the rods to actually be disintegrated fully. And I think that's a very good point. And from my basic understanding of physics, I think he might be right about it as well. And so rods wouldn't really be as effective against other spaceships unless the spaceship was big enough and had enough mass for the rod to actually hit enough material to cause enough explosions, vibrations and whatnot to be an effective weapon. But where the rods become really effective in spaceship against spaceship combat is against the shields because the shields require a massive hit to be reduced in energy. And that's exactly what the rods can do, because the shield will try and stop the rod completely as if it was hitting a massive solid object, which then releases all the energy that is in those rods from their incredible kinetic energy, and then they reach their full potential as a massive energy weapon, which is the equivalent of several nuclear ex bombs. It's huge, that type of energy. And so you would try and get rid of someone's shields through the use of rods, and once those shields are down, then you would switch back to the energy cannons you have on those turrets. And so then, with the guns, it covers all the bases that I would kind of want with this ship. So cargo, transportation, reconnaissance, long-range, short-range scouting, prospecting, and exploration. Now the next big design element that needs to be considered when you're thinking about a spaceship. Well, for me, it was the propulsion engines. Now, of course, you need uh, life support and other things like that, but those are all kind of on the insides of the main body of the ship, and it doesn't really affect the outside design too much. But the position of the propulsion engines, well, yes, they do. So when I consider propulsion engine configuration, I see kind of three main ways that it can be done. The first way is the most common, and I feel the most inefficient, where you have really, really big engines or thrusters at the back of a ship, and that's really it. You can't see any significant thrusters on any other part of a spaceship, and so Star Wars ships really much follow this design philosophy, but they would obviously have some level of maneuvering thrusters that can't really be seen, but they must be there. So what that means then is if the ship wants to slow down at any significant speed, especially at a comparable speed to how, mu how fast it can accelerate, the ship needs to turn around completely by use of its maneuvering thrusters and then be kind of flying backwards and then punch those big forward thrusters to slow it down. Well, that is an extremely inefficient method of uh, deceleration. 
and it seems to be the most commonly used in science fiction. The next method is directional thrusters, and so they have their big thrusters at the back of their ship, but they can be rotated and turned to face the opposite direction to slow the ship down, and that is far more efficient than the first method that I mentioned, but still, it takes time for those thrusters to rotate, and it's from, what, half a second to maybe even three seconds, depending on the size of the thrusters. And those seconds could mean the difference between life and death, and again, to me, it's not what I would want. The most effective method in my mind is having fixed positioned thrusters, which means you would need a propulsion engine or thruster facing each plane. X, Y, Z, forward, back, up, down, you would need all those angles covered. And what that means then is when the ship needs to slow down very quickly, there is no delay from the point you tell it to slow it down for the deceleration to take place because the thrusters are there ready to go. And that means any direction that the ship wants to move in, it can move in instantly and at a far higher rate of speed. Because if you rely on just smaller maneuvering thrusters to move the ship around, well, those smaller maneuvering thrusters are much weaker than the main thrusters or propulsion engines of the ship. But if you had the maneuvering thrusters as equivalent in size and power to the actual primary thrusters, well then the ship can move and move around and ev do everything that you want at the same rate of speed and acceleration as its top accelerating factor. So to cover all the angles that you would need to cover to have fixed positioned thrusters, I made a new design for the Rogue 4x6 SS Mark III. Because on my previous spaceship that I designed, called the Rogue Star, I actually did a more inefficient execution of uh, trying to have fixed positioned thrusters, and that's by having uh, I think it was 12 separate thrusters all up. Yes, 12 full thrusters that had a forward and back thruster on them, which was just way over the top and it didn't work. And so the new method was having a, a single propulsion or thruster engine that has six directional propulsion engines on it. And so this is what I call the 4x6 configuration. Four main big engines with six directional engines on them. And then arranging those four primary engines in a 4x position, so they're the corners of a square or a rectangle essentially, and the ship being centered enough in the center of gravity of what it would be where those thrusters are positioned, the ship can now be maneuvered in any direction instantly. There is no delay at all, and to me that is the most efficient method that I can think of for the propulsion of a spaceship. Now the type of propulsion that is used on this spaceship is gravity propulsion, which is a very fun intellectual kind of puzzle to work your head around to see the practicality of how it would work. And indeed, I've put up a whole video where I try and explore the practicality of gravitational acceleration on a spaceship. So please go check out that video if you're interested in having a fun science-y discussion. The next thing that I would want is uh, having a full view from the cockpit. So when you're in a cockpit, I wouldn't just want the, the, the top of your head and in front of you uh, to be uh, transparent that you see. What about underneath you or all around? I would want to be able to have as large a field of view as possible. And so to do that, you need most of the cockpit to be transparent. And that is exactly what I have put on my ship. And this isn't glass because in within my science fiction setting, it's based so far within the future, I can easily say that they have developed a new transparent material that is very, very strong and offers all the protection you would need for a spaceship. Now, interesting thing about the cockpit is that it also doubles as an escape pod because honestly, if you're on a ship, you want to be out, you want as many chances to be able to survive your ship exploding as possible if you get in a fight and other things like that. And so just having an injector seat doesn't really work in space because you're in space. I mean, it could work if you're wearing a space suit, but you might not be wearing a space suit and then you'd be screwed. So you need an escape pod. And of course, if the actual cockpit was shot and you'd be dead anyway, so that doesn't matter. So this is really if the primary engine is uh, shot or, or anything like that, well, this is where the escape pod comes in. And it's the actual cockpit itself, which is great because you don't need a move from where you're sitting to get to the escape pod to blast out to safety when your ship is about to explode. You can just hit the eject button and the doors close. See here, look, the doors behind the cockpit close and then the cockpit gets ejected and you'll be able to survive. The problem is, is that whoever shot your ship might still be around and then try and shoot your escape pod. So, well look, it just gives you more chances to survive. And of course, within the escape pod is all the, you know, things that you need to survive. Long-term rations, it ha it's capable of short-range travel, and it is also capable of one planetary landing, because once it lands on a planet, it has no power or, or engines or anything to escape that planet's gravity. But it's enough to get to a nearby planet 
if you're near, but it, of, of course, if you're, you know, a light year away from a planet, you're screwed. You'd, but of course, it has a distress signal, and so you would hope then that if you're in the middle of space, that uh, someone will pick up your distress signal and come and pick up your escape pod. Now, with the uh, cockpit being detachable, this actually comes in to another design element of the ship, and that is that it's uh, slightly modular. And so if we were to strip all the ship down, this is kind of what the ship looks like with all the bells and whistles taken off. It has the essentials. So you'd have life support inside the main body of the ship. You have the primary propulsion engines. The primary power core would also be inside the ship. And that's really it. And then you can add things onto it on top of that. The support pylons that hold the primary propulsion engines, well, you can actually fit things within those support pylons, which I've done with the main design of the ship, with additional computer cores and uh, power generators. But you can actually fit other things in there. There's enough head height for those to actually be separate compartments, if you were to wall them off completely, to have two separate small rooms on the spaceship. So there's a bit of options you have within this ship. Now, also with the detachable cockpit, you can actually, a different designed or model cockpit can be attached to the ship, one that has several decks that are a bit larger, a bit wider, or just bigger. So again, more options. For me, I just go with the basic one because this, this is just for one person, me. But if I needed, uh, if I wanted to take another person on, well, the option is there to have a different design cockpit that ha has a bit more room. So because my space shuttle has a big cannon turret on the top and bottom, it made the uh, landing supports a little tricky. And so this is how it works. They, they just extend underneath the bottom of uh, the uh, turret and then the ship can land. But there wasn't really much room for me to put in a door because on the sides of the ship, I, uh, left, I wanted to leave room for components and then you have the rod cannons on the side and the cockpit I wanted fully enclosed as well. And so the way that I could find a door on the ship was through the fact that the uh, cockpit is detachable. And so so when the ship lands, the forward landing supports are on rollers, and then the cockpit just extends out on arms, and a ladder then also extends and is lowered, and that's how you get in and out of the ship. It's a little bit, you know, elaborate, but that was the best way that I could achieve it. Because the cockpit was already detachable, so I didn't need to put in any additional door or uh, part on the ship, because it was already there, so I just was kind of working with what was already there. So there you go, that is the Rogue 4x6 SS Mark III, or the sword, my perfect spaceship. So tell me, what would be your favorite spaceship? What are the design elements that you would want on your perfect spaceship or space shuttle? Please let me know in the comments. I can't wait to read them. Thank you for watching and farewell. <sighs> I wish I could have my ship in a science fiction video game. Maybe I should ask Star Citizen to have a look at it. But honestly, they do such a better job than me with their spaceships. My goodness, have you seen the detail in those ships? But still they use directional thrusters on most of their spaceships, which I just don't like. Okay guys, I'll see you around.